I look at Leanne, I go, critically acclaimed Danny Tuber Friday here. The King is back! It's been approximately 406 days since I quit YouTube to eat dirt professionally. I haven't felt inspired to pick up a manga in over a year. My entire existence is pain punctuated by short moments of... What am I looking at? The greatest piece of manga ever put to jump. Only one chapter and it's already surpassed the big three. Enough time has passed. Hashtag Kagurabachi sweep. That's a bold claim. I'll be the judge of that. Um... Guys... Guys, I think this manga might actually be... started on Twitter. A mangaka by the name of Takaru Hokazono was about to release their first serialized manga. They released a cover page of the series about two weeks early. This was a mistake. Twitter, seeing this stark, raven-haired swordsmith, decided to make a bit of a meme out of it. Kagadabachi is peak. Kagadabachi could beat Goku. Kagadabachi is the next One Piece. But as this happened, it began to grow. Mind you, there's been no content released at this point in the timeline. This meme started from one image. People inserted the protagonist of this manga into other series. Bedsheets. Fortnite. Without like even knowing his name. Even whilst writing this video, I had to remind myself that his name is Chihiro and not Kagadabachi from Sword Art Online. I ask you to imagine my perspective, having worked the past 18 months to graduate a year early, remaining completely off AnyTube for the past year and coming back to uh well, this? The part in Kagurabachi where Peter Griffin unsheathed his dad's last sword? Absolute chill. Kagurabachi is already more iconic than Goku. Kagurabachi, Kagurabachi is more iconic than Goku. Kagurabachi is more influential than the Bible. But it's fine. Because I read it, and... Great Scott, it gets worse. The first chapter of Kagurabachi is 55 pages long. You may be thinking something along the lines of, Friday, that's actually a rather short debut manga chapter, as most series start with a chapter around 70 to 80 pages long. To which I'd reply, NERD! Although you'd be correct. The shorter chapter length actually started me out on a good foot, which I recommend you take note of. We open on a father-son swordsmithing duo. That, that's a tongue twister. Father-son swordsmithing. Father-son swordsmith. <laughs> so we open on a family of swordsmiths. The father speaks in regard to many of the crucial techniques and philosophies that come with Japanese sword making. We even get a bit of light-hearted dialogue between the two in this very grounded, slice-of-life setting. But you see... I just couldn't lose the feeling something was... off. Certain jokes wouldn't land, yet they'd cling to my consciousness, nevertheless. The scatterbrain structure had an uncanny resemblance to Family Guy and how scenes would shift in and out of cutaway gags as they pleased. At one point, they dedicated five pages to a cutaway gag within a cutaway gag about how his dad bought a goldfish. This isn't non-linear storytelling! That's disjointed flashbacks to the third power! I understood Twitter's Morbius mock of hyping up a series no one was actually going to read, but was I wrong to expect something of substance here? I was 26 pages deep, nearly halfway through without a zygote of motive in our protagonist, and not even the foggiest scent of originality in the plot. Chihiro is no defining character trait other than his regrettably empathizable boredom with the manga's exposition. We're told our main character has responsibilities to enroll, mantles to rise to, that as a swordsmith, he is complicit in the murders manifested by his weaponry. But these legitimately interesting themes simply feel divorced from a story this ordinary. As I kept reading, I started to ask questions like, why is he acting like that? Why did the editors not cut that scene? Why did they spend five pages on a goldfish? I understood that not all mangakas can create something Right their first go, so I came to terms with the fact that Hokazono might just need some practice. And then I turned one page and thought, no hyperbole? This page changed the entire course of the manga. Remember how I said this was a grounded, swordsmithing slice of life? Well, I lie. And so did the fucking manga! Those swordsmithing soliloquies weren't for nothing. Those hypothetical murderers can and do exist. Coincidentally, with God! Also, they're the Yakuza. Also, also, it's been 38 months and the dialogue is good now. Keep up. We meet the Yakuza Sorcerer Kingpin, who I can't not imagine sounds like Gus Fring. But you can call me Sus. And he's kind of the coolest character in the entire chapter. It really did feel like the mangaka relearned how to write dialogue at the halfway point just to make this singular character ooze this much charisma and opposition. And to their credit, it definitely worked. Worked so damn well that I nearly forgot we have an actual protagonist traveling on a train post time skip. He's brandishing this distinct facial scar that really suits him now that he's built like a director's cut of Blade Runner 24. And he's undergone this immense shift in attitude that really makes you feel curious. Something happened during those three years, and every piece of new dialogue makes you eager to find out. That scar. You could get it removed, right? It really stands out. Why don't you do something about it? Every morning, 
When I wash my face, I look in the mirror, I see this scar. And remember that day. And so every day, I start the morning with fresh hatred. Bro! What the sh**? This is the first dialogue exchange of our protagonist in present day. Yes, this is the edgiest line known to man, but he wasn't like this before. We've all seen the classic loner giga chat anime protagonist, but it's rare you see someone become that, let alone off screen. Homeboy's archetype went from Tanjiro Kamado to guts. Tell me you're not curious of how that happened. So the train arrived and we cut back to the Yakuza hideout. They're just having some banter, saying some stuff like, if some halfwit had the audacity to waltz up here, we'd take him out. But is anyone really that stupid? They should just shut up and do what they're told. For sure. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I'll take out these guys. You know when I said the dad talks about some irrelevant special sword techniques? Those sword techniques they grazed over were actually imbuing katanas with magical sorcery. Better yet, summoning the goldfish as a sentient spirit sword stand. This story wasn't a slice of life manga about blacksmiths. It's a revenge story about Chihiro brutally murdering every dishonorable sorcerer who wields a sword crafted by his father. Half of the bad lines pre-time skip were actually just foreshadowing. The first half of this manga being mid as hell might have been part of the plan the entire time. I started to ask myself, what kind of person would risk the reputation of their very first serialized manga in the biggest magazine in all of Japan? Is this mangaka a genius, or did they by chance conceive mathematically perfect? I'm gonna give you a scenario here. We open on a wide shot of a man hurling himself off a cliff with nothing but a backpack. Your first reaction, if you're capable of empathy, might be to feel shocked, scared even. But if you zoom out to reveal that the man was jumping off the cliff to catch his daughter, and you realize that the backpack was actually a parachute, the scene by extension shifts from a tragedy to a tale of heroism. You're playing with the same set of simple toys, but the order in which the information was given has changed, by extension changing your perception of the story. See what I'm getting at here? It's the reason why Kagurabachi is such an enigma to me. I'm not entirely sure if the story would have worked if it started post time skip. Yes, we would have had the same toys to play with, but the exhilaration of discovering the genre, the intrigue of the off-screen character arcs, and yes, the fish sword, would have just simply hit differently if the mangaka had just given them to us up front. If you pitched me a series about a boy with a magic water sword who fights sorcerers, I'd say, oh, Again? It truly felt like the framing gave the manga its value, but I couldn't decipher if that was a flawed artistic perception to have. Should our subjective and objective artistic taste be forever segregated, or is it really okay to just have... Bear with me, in order to explain some things, I'm going to have to extract my relationship with Sony Studios Venom. Oh, People do not like this movie. They say it's messy, cliche, poorly written, and above all, a condescendingly commonplace corporate cash grab. And I love it. I love the whimsical dialogue, I love the sparklingly schizophrenic performance of Tom Hardy, and I love the goofiness of it all. A lot of critics are gonna tell you to admit this movie is objectively the worst, but that comes with the prerequisite of ignoring how good of a time it is. If you just take a moment to enjoy this ridiculous piece of Hollywood spectacle, you start to see something beautiful inside. The passion it takes to make a movie this unapologetically edgy. The self-awareness required to pivot to a sequel that's this unremorsefully silly isn't manifested by irony, satire, or mistake. It's heart. Heart that I respect. Heart that propagates throughout the film until you capture a smidge of just how much fun they had making this. So it didn't really matter if the author of Kaganabachi was in on the joke. Maybe they're a genius, or maybe the first chapter was all one miraculous misstep of the writing process. But either way, I just couldn't help but have fun in the end. In conclusion, I don't know if the novelty of the debut's twist will wear off over time. I don't know if this manga will be revered for years to come, but I know I'm having fun. Right here, right now, with the first chapter of Kagadabachi. And yes, Venom 2 is better than Far From Home. I will literally fight you.